So, do you live at life with a destination or a preparation mentality? I'm going to tell you about a guy named Joe. Joe was a guy, when he turned 18, he was just on top of the world. And he doesn't remember when the first credit card application came, but he does remember it coming in the mail. And he remembers just thinking like, wow, I have arrived. Like he got a, a visa application and of course he filled it out. He thought, man, I'm an adult now. He, he filled it out, sent it off. And well, they did what all credit card companies do. They stamped it, approved and gave this 18 year old guy a line of credit that he immediately began to have fun with. He got his girlfriend some new jewelry. He got himself a new watch. He got himself a new phone because he was tired of his parents' hand-me-down phone. You know, the teenager, they always get the phone that the parents don't want anymore, that kind of thing. That's how it goes, right? So he, he was like, I, I'm, I'm done with all of that. And, and he began to, like, feel some of the pressure, you know, of like, okay, this bill now comes every single month. And he started to pick up a few more hours. But he's also going to school because he wanted to go to school to set up himself up and him and his girlfriend for a future and so he started going to school, and because of his work and school and traveling back and forth, he wanted a reliable vehicle. So he thought, well, the next step as an adult is I'm going to get a truck. And so he went to the local truck dealership, and they, of course, financed him a, a nice truck. And he began, he, he thought, he looked at the monthly payment and thought, man, that's going to be a little tight. But I think if I just work a few extra hours, I can make this work. Well, unfortunately, that began to, he began to feel the pressure and the tension of that, and then more credit card um, applications came, and you do what all adults do when, do when one is good, five are better. So he just continued to fill those out, continued to run that up, and, but yet those bills kept coming month after month, and it got pretty tight, and so much so that he had to cut back on school so much that he decided, I'm just going to take a semester off to try to keep up with these bills. And so he tried to work more, and, but he just kept spending, and he bought you know, new hunting gear, new golf clubs, new fishing gear, and the problem was is that he was working so much and trying to do a little bit of school that he had no time to go hunting, fishing, playing golf. Like he had no time to do any of that stuff. And his life just began to get frustrating and he was angry and, and isolated himself a lot of times. And his, his girlfriend noticed that, man, he's just always on edge. He's always seems real tense. He always seems real angry. And he had all this pressure going on in his life. And some people would look at young Joe and they would say, well, you got a financial problem. And, you know, you would be right, but only half right. Because underneath that financial problem, Joe had another problem, which is he was treating this life like it's the destination, not a preparation. And that's the question for all of us. Are you living like this life is the destination? Or are you living the biblical model of this life, which is it's a preparation for all of eternity? So Joe and, and those like him, here, here's what we find, is that living with this life as a destination mentality, I mean, I get it. Here's what happens. This life becomes the destination. So it becomes get everything you can as quickly as you can, as often as you can, have as much fun, as much pleasure as you can, and limit the amount of pain and suffering as much as you can. And the two ideas of, you know, you only live once, YOLO and FOMO, those become the mantras of a destination mentality of like, this life is, is what I'm going to live for. This life is what I'm going to focus on. And what often happens is no matter how much I dream, no matter how much I want, no matter how much I try to manifest myself into believing certain things and getting certain things into my life, here's what happens is life does not care about my dreams. And life is not fair. Life does not stop so that I can have all of my dreams. Life does not stop to make itself fair for me. Life does not stop so that I can find joy and happiness. In fact, life just keeps on moving. Life does what it does and then it keeps on moving. And when this idea that this is my destination, that all the, the joy that I'm created for, all the purpose that I am created for, all the hope that I am created for is going to happen in this life, that this life is the destination, when I live with that mentality, and then the reality of life comes up, those two clash. And what that breeds is frustration. And life is often very, very frustrating. We get frustrated because we don't see a way forward. We get frustrated because we don't understand what's going to happen. And despite, despite my attempts to try to control my way, to try to control my life, life does not stop to me, for me to control it. In fact, life does not slow down for me to control it. 
Life is not fair. Life is complicated. Life is complex. Life calls for really difficult decisions at times. Life is going to make you angry. Life is going to make you frustrated. Life is going to take it the weight of itself and it's going to pile upon your shoulders. And life will eventually move from just feeling frustrated to just feeling flat out hopeless. And life can feel hopeless at times. It can just feel flat out hopeless because we're going to face seasons of the loss of a loved one. Those that I love are going to pass away. Some of you know that story all well. Some of you have already been through losing a loved one. Some of you are going to experience the loss of a job and the loss of the hope that comes from that. Some of you are going to experience rejection from a dear and close friend. And some of you are going to experience some of the ultimate betrayal in life, which is the divorce that you didn't sign up for or the adultery that your spouse committed against you. And some of you are experiencing that now. And man, it, it's not just frustrating. It can leave you feeling completely hopeless. Like there is no way forward. And here's a promise that I can make to you, unfortunately, that very few of you will have trouble believing. Life is not fair. Life will hurt sometimes. Life is complicated. And life will remind you very often of how limited your power and your control and your understanding of life truly is. And at the same time, when all of that is happening, life will not stop. It will continue to move forward. It will continue to move forward without a care of what is going on in your life. And all of this comes forward and it feels like it's hopeless. And the question then is, how do you come back from that? How do you bounce back from this feeling of hopelessness? Now some, this is where some just say, well, this is where I'm out. This is where I'm off. And maybe this is your story. They look at the suffering and the pain of those around them or their loved ones or even their own life. And then they look at the Bible says that God is a loving God. And they can't reconcile the fact that there is suffering and pain in their own life or in the life of someone they love or just even in the world in general. And the fact that God is a loving God. And so they just say, well, I'm out on all of this. This doesn't make sense. It it just that shows that God doesn't exist. And I could understand that. I can understand that. I can empathize with it a little bit. And I could understand it if it were not for one thing, and that's the life of Jesus himself. Because Jesus himself, his life was not fair. His life did not go the the way that uh, that, um, many people would have wanted it to go. He, He is one who experienced betrayal. He is one who experienced rejection. He is one who experienced other people speaking about him. He is the one who experienced people spreading rumors about him. Jesus knew That life is not fair. Jesus knew that life is complicated. Jesus knew that life is going to make you, try to make you feel hopeless. And yet at the same time, Jesus in his darkest moment in the Garden of Gethsemane was able to pray, not my will, but yours be done, Father. Jesus was able to have rest and hope in his darkest hour because he understood that this life was not the destination This life is the preparation for all of eternity. And when I find myself, the awesome thing about Jesus is that when I find myself in Jesus, when I find myself as a Christ follower, is that Jesus eliminates all hopelessness from my life. Now, that's a big and bold promise, but I'm telling you, it is absolutely true that he eliminates all hopelessness. In fact, here's what he says in John 14, 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus just automatically assumes life's going to be hard. Life's going to be difficult. It's going to want to make your heart troubled. But let not your hearts do that. How do you you not? He says, you believe in God. You believe also in me. And then here is his hope. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also And you know the way that I am going. And Jesus, he speaks of this. And and I love this about Jesus is that he looks at our life and he experienced everything that we experienced. And he says, I can eliminate all hopelessness. But he doesn't do it by saying, it's really not that bad. Just chin up. Just, you know, suck it up a little bit. You're going to be fine. Like he doesn't give a pep talk. No, that's not what he does. He says, no, no, what you've got to do is you've got to shift your heart, shift your mindset to see that this life is not the destination, but this life you're being prepared for something that's even greater than anything this life could ever have. And then on the other side, the Bible speaks about how Jesus, he understands and he sympathizes and he empathizes. He knows what our lives are like. 
As I told you a moment ago, Jesus is the one who experienced ultimate betrayal in his darkest moment, his, his deepest moment of need of his closest friends. They were not there. They ran. They left. They ran. They took care of themselves and left Jesus all alone. He knows betrayal. He knows suffering. He knows pain. Jesus was even physically tortured. He knows all those things. In fact, here's how it says it in Hebrews 4, 15. This is from the Message Bible. Talking about Jesus, it says, we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weaknesses and testing, and he experienced it all, and I love how it ends, all but the sin. Jesus went through anything and everything. He experienced the emotions that we're going to go through. He experienced the pain and the suffering that life is going to give to us. And he went through it all, and he went through it perfectly. Jesus never sinned in his life. He was absolutely perfect in every way, shape, and form. And he comes into our lives. And what he does is he brings the hope and he eliminates all hopelessness. So in Paul, in Romans 8, as we've been looking at here for these past few weeks and we're going to look at today, Paul takes this idea and he says, now how, how does the hope of heaven, how does what Jesus says he's doing for us, how does Jesus eliminate my hopelessness? Because Jesus doesn't ever give hope. This is so important. Jesus doesn't give hope to this life without the ultimate hope of heaven. In fact, that's the only way Jesus gives us hope, is Jesus gives us hope by giving us the hope of heaven, and that is supposed to work backwards into this life today. But three things that Paul says Jesus does for us that eliminates our hopelessness. The first thing is that Jesus establishes my hope as God's child. He establishes me. And what this means is that the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the moment you say yes to Jesus, that you become a child of God, becoming a Christian, becoming a child of God, it's not a progressive thing. It happens in a moment, in an instant, that the instant you say yes to Jesus, he legally moves you from an orphan out here on your own, trying to figure out life on your own, to the realm and to the domain of being God's child, where God is your father, God is your, your affection, and God loves you and is uh, focused his life in upon you. That Jesus does all of that for you. He makes you God's child. Here's how it says it in Romans 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. That we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Now, some push back and they say, well, how does Jesus establish me? Like, like what does that mean today? And here's Paul's answer. Is he gives you the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is every much God, that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal, all of them equally God. Distinct persons equally God. The Holy Spirit now lives in my spirit in every moment of every day, even in the darkest moments of every day. The Holy Spirit is present, active, and working and speaking into my spirit that you are loved, you are cared for, that God's grace is shining upon you, God's face is towards you, and that you are a child of the living God. Every moment of every day, that is happening in your deepest spirit. Now, how does this change? How does this give us hope? Let me give you an illustration to help. As you all know, I have four kids, and every single one of them, when they were young, I'm talking two, three years old, every single one of them had a moment like this, where in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., they come into my room, and parents, you know, aunts, uncles, anybody who's ever had a small child sleeping in your house, here's how this goes. You're fast asleep, you're dreaming, you're off in la-la land, and all of a sudden you feel that light tap on your shoulder. And you're not quite sure what it is. And so you don't really, you're like, maybe I'm just dreaming this. And then it gets more aggressive and more aggressive. And then finally it's, you know, beating on you. And you open your eyes and your two-year-old is just staring at you. Like that creepy, weird stare. And you just said, yes, what? what? Is everything okay? What do you need? Your adrenaline's pumping, you know. And they look at you and they say in the sweetest little voice, they say, I'm thirsty. Would you like a glass of water? Yes. So you get up out of bed, you take them to the kitchen, you get them a glass of water. My kids, I would get them a glass of water and I'd take them back to bed and I would pray with them if they were scared and get them all tucked back in and make sure that they were good. And then, of course, I would go on back to sleep. Now, here's the reality. Those four kids, they can do that. But listen, if anybody other than those four kids comes into my bedroom at 2 a.m., taps me on the shoulder and says, I'm thirsty, there's going to be a very different response in that moment than it was for, those four, for my four kids because I'm their father. 
Only a, only a child can go into the father's room at 2 a.m. just to ask for a glass of water. Now listen, that's the kind of access you have to the God of the universe. God is infinitely available to you. God is eternally present with you. You are his child. And if all you need is in the 2 a.m., because that's when these hopeless moments come, right? Where these, you wake up in a cold sweat and you're like, what am I going to do tomorrow about this? And that 2 a.m. call comes. That 2 a.m. panic comes. If all you need in that moment is a glass of cold water, Jesus is right there for you. And he is infinitely available to you because you're his child. The second thing is that Jesus promises hope for my future. No matter how good my relationship is with Jesus, no matter how often I go to him and say, I just need a glass of water, the inevitable question is going to come up, is it all worth it? Look, it's not easy to follow Jesus in this life. It's not easy. It's going to call for discipline. It's going to call for to saying no to a lot of things that culture wants you to say yes to. It's going to call for you to stand alone at times. I mean, we're living in, in a culture. I just read a report this past week from, that Barna released where there is still a steady decline on people's understanding of Jesus, God, and the desire to see Jesus as who he is and see the Bible for what it says it is. So we are... It's not going to get better anytime soon from what it already is. It's not going to be easy. And there's going to be moments where you're going to say, is it worth it? In fact, some of you may have friends or close family members who look at you and they're like, what are you doing? Why do you take this Jesus stuff so seriously? Why do you go to that church every single week? Some of you go a couple times a week. Some of you spend, you know, a, a lot of resources and time. And your friends and your family look at you like, why do you do all of this? Why, what is that small group thing that you go to? Like, what do y'all do in that? Like, do, what do you, you just sit around and talk? Make, like, why? And, and, and you're going to get, and you're going to begin to wonder, is it all worth it? This Jesus that I am following, is it worth it? Here's Paul's answer, verse 18. I consider that the present suffering, the sufferings of this present time, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul's answer, is it worth it? His answer is this, suffering is temporary, glory is eternal. Is it worth it? Suffering is only for this life. Suffering is only for this present time. Glory is only for your future. Is it worth it? Absolutely, it's worth it. And, and here, what is this idea of glory? What, what does this mean? He, I love how he builds this picture out. And he uses creation and then a, a very powerful object lesson towards the end of this. Keep, keep reading verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, meaning nature is not everything it's supposed to be yet. But wait till God is finished with it. I mean, nature's beautiful. I mean, the mountains, the Grand Canyon, the oceans, even our rivers, these types of things, they're amazing. But Paul's saying, wait till God's done with them. How beautiful they're going to be. Continues on, it's not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom from the glory of the children of God. Here's his picture. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. You know, we have several staff members who just, who just spit out kids, right? And Lauren Louvier did. And my wife's done it four times. Here, here's my, the picture because I love how Paul gives us this picture. Have you ever asked... A lady who is 38, 39 weeks pregnant, hey, how you feel? <laughs> Depending on how that day is going to go, you'll either get one of what I found to be three responses. You'll get an eye roll, you'll get a sneer, or you'll get a right hook, <laughs> however the day is going. My wife's done it four times. I've been around others. And look, it, it, it's so inconvenient. I mean, my wife in those 38, 39 you know, 40th week, it's just she didn't sleep. She was uncomfortable. She couldn't breathe. I can remember with one of them, she was like, it, it feels like they're kicking me in the throat. Like they're just everywhere. And it's just so uncomfortable. And we haven't even got to labor yet. Now, the next time, guys, your wife is in labor, look at her and ask her, is it worth it? Don't, 
Don't do that. <laughs> I watched my wife do it four times. I'm here to tell you right now, I would die if I had to go through that. She is so much tougher, so much stronger than I am. There's no way I could do that. And all of that pain, all of that really and somewhat suffering, man, it is awful what ladies have to go through. And in the moment, you will ask them, is it worth it? And they might not say that. But listen, the moment that that baby is born, the moment that baby cries, that first moment they get to hold their child, ask them then, is it worth it? And they will tell you a thousand times, yes, it's all worth it. This is the image that Paul is giving to us. This life, listen, it's inconvenient. It is hard. There are sleepless nights. There are things that don't make sense. There are things that are not fair at all in any way, shape, or form. And here is what Paul is saying is that the hope of heaven says this, is that one day, a thousand years from now, somebody's going to walk up to you, hopefully in heaven, and ask you, is it worth it? And you will say a thousand times, yes. Whatever I went through, whatever my life was, whatever the unfairness, whatever pain and suffering I went through to get to me, be here, that preparation in that life, to, for me to be here, it was all absolutely worth every moment. It's hard for us to see this side. That's why it's called faith. And Paul will say that here in just a second. But he, he goes on. I, I love it. It reminds me of what James says in James 1, 2 through 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For great joy. And I'm reading for the New Living Translation here. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, and you will lack in nothing. This is what James said. He's echoing what Paul says. It's like, listen, when trials come, consider it an opportunity. Consider it a preparation. This life is not the destination. This life is a preparation for the ultimate destination of heaven. So when these trials come, when these moments come, look at them for what they are. They're producing something inside of us that for whatever reason, God says, this is the way it needs to go. I am going to produce something inside of you through this moment. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be painful. Yes, you might feel hopeless, but don't lose hope because God is doing something great and he is preparing you for a glory that you could never comprehend, you could never understand, and you can't imagine how good it's going to be until the moment that you get there. That's what God is doing in our lives. He is preparing us for something. The third thing, not only does Jesus promise, but then Paul doubles down on that and he says, Jesus also guarantees. He guarantees my hope. So a promise is that, you know, I'm going to work as hard as I can to make this happen. But because Jesus is the one making the promise, he can also guarantee it because he's all powerful. And the guarantee is there is no chance that this will not happen. And let me show you how Paul says this. Because Paul says the way he guarantees it is he gives you a down payment on the life that he is preparing you for. Verse 23. But not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the down payment. The first fruits of the Holy Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. For the redemption of our bodies. So Jesus, when you put your faith in him and he transfers you from the domain of darkness to his kingdom and you become God's child, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he lives in your spirit in the innermost parts of your life. And he is consistently and constantly witnessing to you, speaking to you, reassuring you, giving you assurance that God is with you, God is for you, God is loving towards you. God's face and God's power is active and present in your life, that you are loved, you are fully redeemed as God's child. We'll see later on in a few weeks that he actually even prays for you when you don't know what to pray for yourself. The Holy Spirit is constantly active and working. And Paul says, he, the presence of the Spirit, the reassurance that the Spirit gives you, that is the down payment for you to know that the hope of heaven is a reality, that everything that Jesus promises for my future is a reality because I've already got the down payment on it in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, for some, they say, well, that sounds super spiritual, and I don't get how that's supposed to help me today. What that, what's that supposed to do for me today? 
How does that help me when my marriage is struggling? How does that help me when my parents are getting older and I'm trying to take care of them and, you know, they, they forget things or they're just, you know, they're aging and, and they're dying? How does that help me then? How does that help me when I'm not getting along with my teenager or teenagers? How does that help me when I'm not getting along with my parents? How does that help me when I just got inflated out of 25% of my retirement? How do, these are all real experiences that, that people are living today. How does the down payment of the Holy Spirit help me? Let me give you an illustration. Imagine, and this is purely imaginative, but imagine you and a friend, two people walk up to you. You're walking down the street, two people walk up to you. And the first one to your friend looks at them and says, I'm gonna, I wanna give you $1,000. Now this is it, I'm gonna give you $1,000, I'm gonna give it to you once, and this is all I'm ever gonna give. So here's $1,000. Now, your friend is excited, like who's gonna say no to $1,000? I mean, imagine what you can do with 1,000 bucks. If you're Joe at the beginning, you can pay off some stuff. But who, who's going to say no? It's like, yes, thank you. And they're excited. They're happy. But then a, a, another person walks up to you and says, listen, I'm also going to give you $1,000. But here's the deal. This is just the first installment. I'm going to come back to this exact place at this exact time one year from now. And when I do, you meet me here, and I will give you $10 million. That's got your attention. Now, a couple days later, you meet up with this friend of yours. He got $1,000. You got $1,000. And in the meantime, tragedy has happened. Both of you had your wallet stolen with that $1,000 in it. You meet your friend, and you look at him, and he walks in, and he is just so, I mean, he's just, there's, you know, life is just taking everything out of him. He's tripping over his bottom lip. He's so sad. And you ask him, what's going on? He, oh, I lost my 1000 bucks. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, there, that, that was it. That was all I had. That was all I'm ever going to get. That was all that there is. There is no hope now. I'm, I'm lost. I'm gone. And he looks at you and he's like, listen, I know that you lost your thousand dollars. How come you can still like somehow go? How can you go on? And your response is, well, yeah, I mean, I lost my thousand dollars and look, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's hard. It's going to be difficult. I'm angry right now. I'm frustrated. But here's the reality. I know that was just a down payment. There's still more to come. And all I got to do is go meet that guy next year, and I got $10 million coming. So this season's going to be hard. But that promise, I'm going to hold on to that. This is what Jesus is, this is what Paul's saying Jesus has done for us. Jesus is the one who's walked up to you and said, I've given you $1,000. There's $10 million to come. And you and I were getting so wrapped up and sad and downcast and distraught because this petty little stuff that we've got in our life, somebody is threatening it or taking it away. When Jesus has promised you all glory, all heaven, everything that you would ever hope, want, or dream, but you got to wait for it. You can't get all wrapped up in this little bitty life and not be waiting for the glory to be revealed when Jesus comes back. How does that matter? Man, when, when, you're, when your marriage is struggling, that, that's the threat. That's the one who's going to try to take away your hope and your joy, the down payment that Jesus has made into your life. You can't put your focus all on that. You can't put your hope all in that. You've got to put your hope into what Jesus will come, will bring you. And listen, it's going to feel like all hope is lost until the moment Jesus shows up, and then you will be able to say, why did I ever doubt him? Here he is. Look at what he has done. Look at what he is doing. And all of this, Paul is showing us that where I have to get to, where you and I have to get to, is we have to grab hold of these promises and that the hope of heaven is what eliminates all hopelessness. The hope of heaven eliminates every bit of hopelessness that you are going to experience. Every bit of hopelessness that you might feel or want to dive into, the hope of heaven is the only remedy that will eliminate all of that hopelessness. Because here's what hope does. I've had this basketball sitting up there. Many of you have been thinking, why is there a basketball sitting up there? The hope of heaven, it makes you buoyant. It gives you the strength to bounce back in life. Because life, just like this basketball, just like many of you are watching the professionals do right now in the playoffs, it, just, it does nothing but want to throw you down. But what the hope of heaven does, just like this ball, is it allows you you bounce right back. No matter how hard life throws you down. In fact, the hope of heaven will say that, look, no, if life throws you down harder, you just bounce back higher. You ever tried to take a basketball and shove it underwater and hold it there? It fights with everything it's got to get back to the surface. 
That's what the hope of heaven allows your life to do. The hope of heaven allows you to bounce back. The hope of heaven doesn't allow life to keep you pressed down because you are fighting with the hope, with the glory that Jesus is working, with the glory that Jesus is going to bring, with the hope of Jesus, with the Holy Spirit working in your life. You are working to push yourself to the surface because that's what hope does. No matter how much it pushes you down, you come back, you bounce back, and you come back with joy that cannot be taken away from you. Let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. Your spouse comes to you and they say, listen, I've got an addiction. And I've been dealing with this, this addiction since before we were married. And I've been trying to fight it in, the, in secret our entire marriage. But now I can't fight it any longer. In fact, I'm powerless to fight it. And I've got to bring it out to the open. And the problem is, is it's going to affect you deeply. And it's not your fault but it's, gonna, it's going to hurt you. In that moment, what is your hope going to hold on to? Because the hope of heaven that allows you to bounce back, here's what it says. It doesn't say, oh, that's not that big a deal. No, it says, no, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this is going to be a season that's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. There's, you're going to be angry on certain days. You're going to want to walk away. You're going to want to quit on certain days. But the hope of heaven says this. It says that Jesus through the Holy Spirit is active and present in my marriage and that there is a day when we are going to look back and we're going to say that was a hard season we went through. But was it worth it? Absolutely it was worth it. Because you will bounce back because Jesus is not done with you or with your marriage. That's what the hope of heaven says. Another one. Your spouse got the dream job. Y'all have been having financial problems. You've been struggling, right, you know, paycheck to paycheck. But now he or she, they just got the job that y'all have been praying for. And it is an answer to prayer. The financial strain is gone. Everything's looking upwards, upwards and to the right. But then three months later, an unforeseen thing happens in the company. And they come to your spouse and they say, listen, I know we just brought you on, but you're the newest one in. Now you're the first one out. And that job is gone. And your spouse comes home and says, I, I can't believe this. What are you going to do in that moment? If all of your hope was in that job, then life is going to press you down and you will have no bounce back. But if your hope is in something greater, in something bigger, something more glorious, here's the reality. You can bounce back. Yes, you will have less money. And yes, it's going to be hard, and you will be angry, you will be frustrated, you will cry, you will be upset at times, and you might even say, you might even tell God, God, this isn't fair. And that's all true, but the hope of heaven says this, Jesus is my ultimate provider. And as long as we put our hope and our trust and our faith in him, there's going to come a day when, when Jesus comes back or we go to him and we get to see him in glory, the hope of heaven is we're going to say that was a hard season. I wouldn't go through it again. I wouldn't want to wish it on anybody that I love, but it was worth it. I will have less money, but I won't have less hope as long as I have Jesus. One more, and this one's probably one that stays hidden quite a bit, but I know it's a reality, and this one's heavy, and I get that. But you find out that your child was abused when they were younger. Not by your spouse, but by someone close, by a, you know, a family member, a friend, someone along those lines. And your kid never told you until later in life. And now it's been years, 10, 15, 20, who knows, maybe 30 years. And you instantly, the moment, as a dad, you hear that and you think, man, I just... You just want revenge. You want vengeance. You're so angry. And yet at the same time, you feel so powerless. And you have so much regret. What should I have done? What could I have done? In that moment, the hope of heaven that allows you to bounce back because life has just really pushed you down. And it is difficult. And there, again, you're going to be angry, rightfully so. You're going to say this isn't fair, rightfully so. You're going to say I want to take it out upon them, and rightfully so. But yet we're powerless to do anything about it. We can't even, even change the past no matter what we do. But what the hope of heaven says, what Jesus is going to do, 
is that the hope of heaven says that I can turn, Jesus will turn even the darkest of moments into glory. And listen, as your pastor, I can't tell you how he's going to do that. I can just tell you that's what he says he's going to do. And I can trust him. Here's the reality of what Jesus promises in Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. For there to be no more crying, no more mourning. What does this mean? I think C.S. Lewis, in talking about this, understood this. And I think he was right. He said, how, we don't understand. And we might not ever understand. But somehow, when we get to heaven, that hope of heaven that we get to experience fully one day, somehow, some way, God is going to, in all of his power, is going to take all of that glory And not only is it going to work forward into my future, but it's going to work backwards into this life that I've experienced. And all of that agony will turn to glory. How will that happen? I only trust him with how he's going to do that. But that's the promise that he has made to those who call him their savior. That's the promise he's made to all of us. So what circumstance? What situation, what relationship are you feeling pressed down by life on? Where do you need the hope of heaven to help you bounce back, to make you buoyant, to come back to the surface? Without Jesus, I'm just going to be honest with you, you have no hope. But with Jesus, there is no end to the hope that you can have. Because he gives you the hope of heaven, and that eliminates all hopelessness in your life. Let's pray. God, you give us such great promises. And I know that there's people all across this room who are going through just storms, the darkest seasons of their life, perhaps. And God, all they've got right now is a promise that one day it will all be worth it. So, Father, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. You would comfort them. You would comfort them with grace. Comfort them with your love. Comfort them with your care that only you can give. Jesus, we look to you because we know you alone are our hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.